that five-second interruption was not meant as a uh, emphasis on uh, listen to this carefully. It was called your pastor losing his place in the gospel. <laughs> that happens sometimes when you look up and you look back down and all you see is words and you go, oh, what line was I on? But notice how he didn't sweat. You know what I mean? It was just, it was as if, yes, he's doing this because he's getting ready for his James Earl Jones voice of the father speaking down, this is my beloved son in whom I am much pleased. Listen to him. This is a great, incredible rock star gospel for a number of reasons. First of all, how many of the folks here went with me to Jerusalem last year? There we go. There we go. A few more. You, like me, have been up on Mount Tabor. And they can tell you how cool this is. Because the way the mountain is, it takes you a while to get up there, and you get up there, and you're looking, and there's the sky, it seems, is like right above you. It's the way the mount is. And Tabor had been considered a holy mountain by the Jews way before, way before Jesus had chosen it to be the spot where he would go to be with his father, with Peter, James, and John. Now, oh, notice, only three of the apostles are chosen. Peter, our namesake here, the first pope, and James and John, the Thuns of Thunder. I should give John's full name, shouldn't I? Because we're not giving him due justice, because anyone named John, with John the apostle as his namesake, would not want this to be missed. It's, and remember this, folks, John the Beloved. Anyway, <laughs> so... Transfiguration is this moment where, remember, how many used to have those um, projectors, the two real projectors when we were little kids, and mom and dad would set it up in the backyard or grandma and grandpa and would point it at the garage and you'd have the sheet hanging, and then you'd see this image before you and it was supposed to be a movie? That's Transfiguration. Jesus was set up above them. And next to him is Moses representing the law and Elijah representing all the prophets. Now, I was listening the other day to an audio book that actually Charlie, our seminarian, had referred it to me. It's about two and a half hours long on audio books. It's a short book, but it is really good. It's Fulton Sheen's treatment of the life of Jesus. And Archbishop Sheen is, is chatting about the comparison of Christ looking at church history, all faiths history, just from the perspective of who was talked about before they came, who was pro, uh, prognosticated, prognosticated before they got here. When we talk about Muhammad, there's no prognostication of Muhammad. When we talk about Confucius, there's no prognostication of Confucius. When we talk about Buddha, the Buddha is only of the time he is in. No prognostication of Buddha. Jesus Christ is starkly different in the history of faiths. The first reading that was so beautifully done this morning, because I have my A-team readers for Transfiguration here today, in fact, we have to welcome back one of our readers who, this is her first time back as our reader, the second reader today, first time back since COVID. Isn't that awesome? So I'm so happy she's reading again. So those two beautiful readings, the first one they refer to the ancient one. The ancient one, of course, is God the Father. But who else do they talk about? One like a son of man, the Lamb. That would have been written 800 years before Christmas. 800 years. The Messiah is written about 30 or 40 times by reference or allusion in the Old Testament. In fact, that three and a half hour homily threat I carried out in the beginning of Mass, that could actually it would take you about three hours to have a good, solid, decent, meritorious lecture 
on how many times Christ is referred to before he shows up. When dad, Abba, the father, decides he's going to put his hand on history and stop history and stick his son into human history, he makes a big deal out of it. And he tells us he's going to do it. And he talked about this through his prophets in the Old Testament. And again and again this is alluded to. One like the Son of Man. A lamb will come among you. The anointed one. The holy one. The Messiah. This is Jesus the Christ. So that's the first thing that should just, for all of us today, sitting here in Mount Clemens, ready to witness a miracle on the altar in about 15 minutes, this should be your biggest reaffirmation of your faith. It should be the big deal. Because transfiguration is in fact a huge deal. Notice who the Father chooses. He places Moses, who's been dead for about 600 years, and Elijah, dead for 500 and something years, right next to each other. On either side of the Savior of the universe. Now, in comes a very important, not really insignificant at the time, because he's told to shut up by God the Father, as you heard. Here comes our namesake, Pete. He represents us. Now notice how Peter, the first pope, decides, hey, how about a little something for the effort? I got to do something here. And so he says to the Son of the living God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus the Christ, the Savior of the universe, hey, boss, isn't it good that we're here, the three of us? We'll build tents. Now ask yourself for a moment, why would Elijah... And Moses, who have been dead for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and the second person of the Trinity need a tent. They don't. But humans like doing this. We like speaking up because we want attention. And what happens to Pete as he's mid sentence? The father shuts him up and tells him and the other two, three of the first bishops of the 12 bishops of the church, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. Yes, I'm speaking to the four gorgeous children right there in that pew. Listen to him. Now, why is this so important? Well, first of all, we got to put it in context. What had happened about seven to ten days earlier to Jesus and his boys as they're out ministering? They're in a place called Caesarei, okay? And they're, they're out there and Philippi, Philippi, Caesarea Philippi. And they're at Caesarea Philippi, and what happens? Jesus asks the apostles, who do people say that I am? And the answer back to him is, say, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Well, we're going to see him a week later, aren't we? And some say they give some other name. And then he asks them as a group, who do you say that I am? Now, they remain silent for a moment. And in his book, Archbishop Sheen makes a big deal out of this. They remain silent. And then only one of them speaks up. And who is that? Our namesake, St. Peter, the first pope. And he says, you are the living Christ. The, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, the Messiah. And Jesus said to him, Peter, you do not get this from your own knowledge, but it has been given to you by my Father. And thou art Peter. 
and upon this rock I shall build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The sins you forgive shall be forgiven. The sins you retain shall be retained. Now, for those of you out here who are master theologians, I'm sorry for the catechetical lesson. But isn't it nice once in a while for your priest to take a thread and a needle and connect various portions of your faith for you? That's called catechism, something that's been missing from the church for 40 years, and it shows. A lot of people don't understand our faith. They don't understand how block number one fits with block number two. It's like building a model plane. Now, after being at this mass today, do I have any of my eighth graders this year going into eighth grade? Anyone here in eighth grade? Nobody? Really? Oh, right there. There's a victim. Okay. So, <laughs> so this year, I'm sorry, but you know, I used to teach law. And it's called, you know, there's a method for this, okay? And we usually in class, we'd make you stand up. Should I do that? Okay, I won't. Um, here's the deal. He will know come spring when it's time to get confirmed when I have him up here sitting with me in the sanctuary on oral exam day and I point to that cross and I say, is that guy God? He's going to answer, yes, because he's a second person of the Trinity, the Son. Now, this is huge. This is huge. Now, how does it apply to our life in 2023? Because a lot of people will say, Father, the transfiguration is a beautiful, beautiful story, but in a very human way, what's in it for me? Well, I'll tell you. What's the message from the Father? First of all, for those of us who went to Mount Tabor, I encourage all of you next spring to come with me back to the Holy Land. Come to the Holy Land. Until you see this, it is just so different. It changes you as a person. And we already have a ton of people signed up, but let me tell you, I'm making room for more. The more people I can bring, the, more, the better. Because it changes you. I will never forget celebrating Mass on the tomb of Jesus Christ. It changes you. Because you're sitting there going, 2,000 years ago his body was here, and then it rose from the dead, so it isn't here, and now I'm transubstantiating the Eucharist, and he's back. Wrap that around your medulla oblongata three or four times. Likewise on Mount Tabor. You're up on Mount Tabor, and you're looking at the very sky where the words of the Father, the Ancient One, came down upon these three apostles. This is my beloved Son in whom I am much pleased. Listen to him. And so I say to all of you, my friends, whose souls have been entrusted to me by our Archbishop, that's a big statement, entrusted to my care by our Archbishop. People don't realize that's what's in the letter we get when you're made a pastor someplace or later a moderator. For the care of the souls. That message, that mandate, that command from the Father is as pertinent, in fact, more pertinent today than it was back then. We live in a broken world. You want an example of how broken our world is? Oh, sure, of course, I'll give you one. Last week, I'm driving down, what's the street over there? It's uh, Pine. I'm on Pine. This will shock all of you. Heading from the direction of Champagne Chocolates. <laughs> I'm in my car. I'm at the stoplight, stop sign. You know the stop sign in front of our friends over here next door at Mount Zion? I'm right in that intersection. And my housekeeper, Marlene, had said, don't come back to the house for an hour, because I was going to work in my study, and because I'm cleaning up. Poor Marlene, she's here today, pray for her. Anyway, <laughs> she goes, I'm cleaning up, take about an hour. So, you know, what would any good priest do? He goes to champagne chocolate, you know. And I'm heading back, and I had to do another errand, so I didn't walk. I drove. 
I'm at the stop sign. I notice there's a very nice young lady off to here to the right in her car, and she's waiting. And so we're both waiting, looking at each other, because there's a red pickup truck right across the intersection, and he hasn't moved. He won't move. And we're waiting for him. It's his turn. So I'm afraid there's a medical emergency or something. So I wave through the nice young lady, and I run through the stop sign, and I stop. And I stop next to him. And I go like this through the window. And he gave me a finger gesture too. It just wasn't the thumb. <laughs> By the way, did I mention I was wearing a Roman collar? Now ask yourself, who does that? Red pickup truck, one of these work guys who like, you know, in the construction business or something. Um, not that I'd really know, but I did take a picture of the license place just in case one of my sheriff buddies would like to know. I don't know, you know. But I, I ask this, I put it to you, because what does that say about our society? You're worried about somebody, you stop to help them, and they perceive that as an encroachment upon their privacy because you see they have the God-given right to stop at a stop sign, hold up traffic, and never move. Now that's called a messed up society. Now why is it when I fly to Tokyo on vacation and I go to my favorite store, Sogo's, and I pick up a present for my staff, some really good cookies that they really love, and I get this big container of cookies, and it's perfectly gift-wrapped. And when I say perfectly gift-wrapped, even the Russian judge would give it a 10.0. And the thing is just perfectly wrapped. And then the nice Japanese girl brings it from around the counter and holds it up like this and says, in Japanese, thank you so very much for honoring us with your presence in Sogos today. And then if I go, and that's very much like it was at J.L. Hudson's 40 years ago. But then I go to a local store, what used to be J.L. Hudson's, and I go and try and buy a pair of black trousers, and I say, can I try these on? And the very young lady who's working there essentially throws them at me and says, whatever. Whatever. Now I ask you, how did we tolerate this happening to our society? How did we allow this to happen to our society? Because you and I allowed it. You and I permitted it. Now, what do we do about it? We live the words of transfiguration. This is my beloved son in whom I am much pleased. Listen to him. And we listen to him by being his warm eyes by being his warm smile, and by being the words of the gospel in everything we do today. For if we fail, we fail at our own peril. We must reclaim our decent society following the way of the Lord back. And the day we do that is a day we grow closer to heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.